while others claim he's a demonic symbol of decadence. Depending upon who you talk to, he's either a Satan or a savior. His is a world populated by spiders from Mars, thin white dukes, and diamond dogs. His image transcends sexuality. His vision encompasses both the depths of a city in ruins and the heights across the universe. This week on the special of the week, the man who fell to earth. One by one, he stripped away the masks of the characters who possessed him. It was a painful process, but if you want to find out who you really are, you're going to have to go through some changes, like David Bowie. Still don't know what I was waiting for, and my time was running wild in the dead end streets, and every time I thought I got it made, it seemed the taste was not so sweet. So I turned myself to face me, but I've never caught a glimpse. think you know no longer exists. The outrageous performer with orange hair who used to slither across the concert stage like a snake is in reality a gentleman. Some find the real Bowie a disappointment. I was always a pretty placid person and I <laughs> often did disappoint people when they met me to not you know, expect me to be lying on leopard skins and shooting up or something. I, think, I don't exactly know what they expected me to be like. Most of the time people would say, well, Christ, we, you know, Hmm, you are a disappointment. <laughs> you haven't even got a green face under all that makeup. Thursday, I had the makeup on his face. David has a red face when he recalls his wilder days. But before all that, before there was a Ziggy Stardust or a Halloween Jack, there was David Jones. All right, David Jones. I was at art school. I, I left art school and went to advertising agency as a commercial artist. And that was pretty disappointing as a career because I had to work on other people's ideas all the time. I always wanted to be a painter, but there was no real outlet in advertising for a painter. You are not a victim. You just scream with boredom, you are not evicting time. David discovered another creative outlet, painting pictures with music instead of brushes. He started playing saxophone with a rhythm and blues band in London. The night their lead singer got sick, David was pushed out front as the band's new vocalist. And uh, I pretty much stayed there from then on, and that's when I started writing songs. But I wanted to present them in a more theatrical manner because um, I didn't have faith in myself as a, a rock singer or rhythm and blues singer. So I thought I'd start developing characters to perform for me, to give me a screen to sort of work on. From the beginning, David wanted to bring the theater into rock and roll. It came so naturally to him, you'd think he was raised in the English music hall tradition. No, not really. My, no, my knowledge of theater was pretty limited. I didn't know how it was going to work at that time. And uh, the breakthrough for me artistically was um, having the chance to join a mime company. And I simultaneously was working in a jazz band and painting and all the other liberal arts. I was uh, very much part of the London Underground at that time. What was called the London Underground. The children of the summer's end Gathered in the dampened grass We played our songs and felt the London sky Resting on our hands, it was God's land It was rugged and naive, it was heaven David would soon surface from the London underground But before he could record his first album, he'd have to solve one problem 
Another British singer, whose reputation was rising even faster than his, was also named David Jones. A band called The Monkeys started and Davy Jones was becoming known. I thought I gotta do something about that pretty fast. So. The name Bowie was pretty arbitrary. It had lots of connotations and cutting edges and knives. The minute David Jones became David Bowie, he'd taken the first step that would one day end in a nightmare. The creation of new characters in place of himself. While his first two albums were relatively tame, they didn't sell well in America. So his record company shipped him across the Atlantic for a whirlwind promotional tour. It was a hazardous affair, mostly by Greyhound Bus. <laughs> no expense spared. <laughs> it was real kit bag stuff. I mean, I, I had a, a sort of a knapsack and some very old clothes and some of my old stage clothes. And uh, I wore them around. But I think just for shock value more than anything else, just to see it. I think, well, let's plant a bit of pre Raphaelite England into Akron, Ohio, and see what happens. I'm the twisted name on Garbo's eyes. take more than wearing outlandish clothes and giving outrageous interviews to make David Bowie a star. He needed what all aspiring artists need, a hit single. He found the inspiration for that first hit the day the first astronaut walked on the moon. He got to thinking, what if an astronaut simply decided not to come back, to keep going through the limitless reaches of space? Apparently, David wasn't the only one asking that question. It was a major hit in England, and much later on again, in America, the years afterwards, it's become one of those dear golden oldies now. Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. Seven.
Martians invade America. Next on the Special of the Week. The Special of the Week continues with David Bowie. With the success of Space Oddity, David was ready to return to America. But this time, he would ride in a limousine, not a bus. He would wear elaborate costumes, not tattered rags. And his name would no longer be just David Bowie. Because this time, he returned to Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. A Ziggy played guitar. Ziggy was my Martian messiah who twanged a guitar. I think that a lot of my writing is, is fairly, it's, the early writing is very simplistic, but it was insidious enough in its under rhythms and the textures of the music itself to, uh, it, that it created its own uh, momentum. Ziggy did especially. I mean, he created all kinds of images in the minds of the people that listened to him. And I had so many different interpretations of what he was sent back to me. Which I feel is half the fulfillment is, is seeing what other people think of the characters that I create. There's a stepping into character. Lots of them. And if the public was confused, so was David. Every time I put out an album, I would adopt the character of that album and try and personify that thing on stage and change the set accordingly. It would become a complete production. And I would um, take the character through into the interviews as well. Unbeknown to most of the interviews, the idea was that I was going to use myself as part of the production. But I didn't want to stop just when I got off the stage. Anytime I was in public, I was whoever it was at the time. Trouble was, not even David could be sure which one of his characters was speaking for. We had a friend, a talking man, who spoke of many powers he had. Not of the best of men, but ours. We used him, we let him use his powers. Each character had his own point of view, and it was adopting all these different points of views and, and having to believe in them wholeheartedly for just short periods of time and suddenly changing horses completely that was uh, really turning my head about. It's not that unusual to find fans patterning themselves after their favorite artists, but a new spectacle was happening at David's concerts. The audience was adopting the message, not the medium. It was very odd to see quite a large number of young people following um, a theatrical character adopting the stance of a character that didn't exist at all. They developed their own lifestyle to go with the character of Ziggy. Which was quite... <laughs> and I had to follow them. <laughs> They'd write and tell me all, all their communications they, they had with Mars and stuff. And <laughs> it got quite, quite far out. <laughs> it got very bizarre. David a celebrity, it also gave him the opportunity to visit a distant alien world he'd only read about in books, America. He expected to find the America written about by Jack Kerouac, whose book On the Road was a tour guide to the beatnik phenomenon of the 50s. I didn't find the, the America that I'd read about. I found a different one that I also was intoxicated by. I felt it very magnetic. But it was a different picture to correct. Well, of course it had to be because it was a decade, at least a decade apart, but it was nonetheless still an adventure for me, of course. And there were parts of New York that still had the aroma of, of what I felt in the Kerouac books. 
But I found a whole crop of new people and found out about the new underground scene. And David took his impressions of America and wove them into a new character to replace Ziggy Stardust. His name? Aladdin Sane. He was an extension of Ziggy on one hand, but on the other hand, was a, it was a more uh, subjective thing. Aladdin was my observations of America, the rock and roll America. Here I was on these great tour circuits, not enjoying it very much. And so, inevitably, my writing sort of reflected that kind of schizophrenia that I was going through, wanting to be up on the stage performing my songs, but on, on the other hand, not really wanting to be on the, those planes or those buses at all, with all those strange people. And being basically fairly quiet person, it was uh, fairly hard to come to terms with. So Latin saying was very much split down the... to make it clear at that time that I was intending to change character all the time because there hadn't been a rock artist at that time that had played characters. The rock artist always was just what or would have you believe that he was the same on stage as off stage and it was, this is me and I wanted to um, revolt against that. I wanted to do exactly the opposite. And if anybody wanted to stand up in front of 20,000 people is not the average thought. I mean, it's not, it's not what everybody would have themselves do. By trying to be all things to all people, David Bowie was becoming nothing to himself. As he constantly created new characters, the memory of the real Bowie, David Jones, slowly faded into the background. He found himself in the middle ring of a frenzied rock and roll circus. And he knew that unless he acted quickly, he'd never escape. But pulled him just behind the bridge, he lays her down. On the special of the week. Now back to the special of the week with David Bowie. Membership in the international jet set can be hazardous, especially if you're afraid of flying. And as David's career flew higher, his perception of the world grew bleaker. It may have touched bottom with his next character, Halloween Jack. The, the original idea of Diamond Dogs, of course, was um, George Orwell's 1984. And in fact, what I had wanted to do was a sort of a musical version of it. And at one time, I, I had asked permission from Mrs. Orwell, but it wasn't granted. So um, I had to take it off on my on a tangent and just produce my own idea of the story without infringing Orwell's too much. So I never know what's going to happen to any of my things when I start doing them. They just turn out differently to the way I imagined they were going. Diamond 
Herman Dogs wasn't exactly a light-hearted musical comedy. Instead, it was a terrifying glimpse into a future of chaos and despair. Ironically, David's audience was still living in the fantasy land of Ziggy Stardust. It's supposedly decadent, which I thought ironic, because I was actually the, the least decadent person that I knew, but Diamond Dogs, uh, that was the most decadent relationship, artist-audience relationship, this terrible, we're gonna die. <laughs> I mean, it was all, I mean, wow. So Halloween Jack would go on stage and there was still quite a few ziggers in the audience and there was this Puerto Rican guy on stage with funny strides on and big shouldered jackets and short bottoms and skinny ties, desperate eyes. of bringing the theater into rock and roll had developed into the theater of the absurd. And while the play he'd created was a smash hit, it was also becoming clear that the show could go on without him. And once the whole thing had started rolling, I mean, it rolled on just out of all proportion to the way I'd en envisaged it. A lot of it was coupling up what Ziggy had been and then adding that on to Aladdin saying, and then the com combination of that was then added on to the time. So by the time Diamond Dogs got had this one great absurd personality. If David Bowie were to rediscover the David Jones living inside him, he'd need some changes in scenery, in music, and in writing partners. The new scenery and the new music were in Philadelphia. The new writing partner was in New York, John Lennon. They slither wildly and they slip away across the universe. Pools of sorrow, waves of joy, heart drifting through my open mind, possessing and caressing me. Philadelphia sound, but the, the lyrical content was a potpourri of our various manager, manager problems that we both had, and that was uh, one of the most uh, exciting collaborations that I've, I've had. It was brief, but it was uh, very rewarding in more ways than one. I mean, it was a, a remarkable success in America, which I, I hadn't envisaged happening to quite such an extent. It was much of a Polaroid of what was happening in, in America, in my eyes, as far as music was concerned. They're next on the special of the week. The special of the week continues with the many faces of David Bowie. 
You often read about actors who play villains on soap operas. While walking down the street, they're attacked by overzealous fans who've confused television with real life. Well, that's exactly what was happening to David Bowie, but in triplicate. And then I moved to Los Angeles, which didn't help me. <laughs> and then that's when the mix-up started happening, with those three characters behind me that wouldn't leave me alone. I was being addressed by people as any one of those three people. People would come at me and talk to me as though I was either Jack or Ziggy or Lad Insane. And, and I hadn't remembered how it was, what it was like to be treated as David Jones at all, because there was nobody who knew that I was that as well. It was like if somebody came up to you and said, hi, John, and then the next person said, hey, Henry, great to see you again. And Charlie, looking good. <laughs> to discuss precisely what drove him to the brink of reality. He simply sums it all up with the name of a particular American city. Los Angeles. <laughs> I, reached my, I reached my pinnacle of madness in Los Angeles, and that was a breaking point for me. And somebody pulled me out of it, or drew my attention to the state of the, my particular nation <laughs> in there. And um, he turned me around and gave me a push and said, go home. <laughs> And sort yourself out. And so I physically opened the wardrobe door one day and mentally put in all my characters into the wardrobe and closed the door and locked it and left Los Angeles. And I haven't been back. <clears throat> I still have the key. <laughs> I never had the guts to throw the key away. <laughs> never know, I might need them. Although David abandoned the characters he'd created, he didn't abandon rock and roll. Like the reformed gambler who still vacations in Las Vegas, David still views the power of rock with fascination. I still think in terms of being a painter, and I, I think of music as painting. My lack of success as a painter decided me to embrace music and try and make that my oils or my acrylics or whatever. Um, I never really loved rock and roll as a lifestyle. I mean, or love rock and roll for rock and roll's sake. I wanted to use rock and roll as a medium, as one would use paint. And um, I used the stage and myself as a canvas point. And I've always seen it in those terms. Thank you. 
costume changes and elaborate set designs, David's early concerts were an electrifying shock in an era when the only props on stage were the musicians themselves. But today, theatrical rock is commonplace. True to form, David's already moved on to the next stage. I'm rather disinterested in the idea of theater rock to that um, extent. I, I've, um, I've been doing it for a long time now, and I've created a, quite a few characters, and I just, as I said, I became bored with my writing style. And I'm getting so much enjoyment just with the experiment of, of creating new ways of writing. That in itself has become something for me to really get involved with. Still don't know what I was waiting for And my time was running wild In dead end streets And every time I thought I got it made It seemed the taste was not so sweet So I turned myself to face me But I've never caught a glimpse How the others will see the faker I'm much too bad to take that test tracks in Berlin. Next, on the Special of the Week, we now return to the Special of the Week with David Bowie. David was once the pop star par excellence, manipulating the media at will. But today, he's removed himself as far as possible from the pop scene. I don't know what music is being played in the West at the moment. I have no, no idea whatsoever. I couldn't tell you one album in the um, album chart. As David surveys the planet from his Berlin recording studio, he feels some things about his music haven't changed, like his ability to capture the character of society at any given moment. Suddenly we have a film called Heroes. There's another band who produced an album called No More Heroes. The word heroes has suddenly presented itself at the very time that I have cut myself off from having anything to do with heroes or personalities or characters.